If you have the Christian Family Handbook in front of you, we're going to be going through pages 15 and 16 today. And uh, closest to the heart of a parent, a Christian parent that is, uh, those that are unsaved have no idea about this stuff that we're talking about, is the state of their children. Is their profession of faith childlike or just childish? Are they converted or not? And then are they ready for baptism or not? While I attempt to answer this question fairly today, I realize that I am on this journey too, with four children and the oldest one only being almost eight. Uh, I understand that I'm only on the base camp of Mount Everest, and a lot of you are already farther in altitude than I am. So anecdotes at this point are going to be limited, but there's clear truths from Scripture that I can present to you that is good for all ages. If God has done a work of grace in someone's soul, then that's going to be seen in an adult as well as a child the same way, but there's going to be little differences, and we're going to see how that's going to come about. Not only can we see if a work is done in someone's soul, but also is a work going to be done in a child's soul? And I'm going to get into that a little later. But even as we talk about evidences of conversion and grace, if God has done a work in someone or not, we must keep before our eyes 1 Samuel 16:7. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Still, as our text shows, children have a quality to them that is exemplary for disciples. And the disciples, they're in many ways just like us. They were asking the question that they did because they were ambitious for the highest place. They wanted to know which one of them was the greatest, and it's, it's just like us. But children, Jesus points out, are what they need to learn from. Why? They're humble, humble little things, children are. And uh, Matthew Poole comments on this. When Jesus says, unless you turn, we hear in our English translation back then, unless you be converted... It does not signify the change or conversion of a soul from a state of sin unto God. So the apostles were already converted, but the turning of their souls from a particular lust or error into the opposite right way of truth and holiness. Except you repent of your pride and ambition, you cannot be saved. The next words expound it and, becomes, sorry, and become as little children. Not as little children in all things. There are some ways that children are exemplary for us and other ways in which they're not. But he lists some things here that I think are good for us to take on and to consider. Little children know not what dominion is. To reign. If you have a little child in front of you and you hold a crown and you say, Here, you can be a king. You want lands and people to look after and to tell what to do. I mean, they could play that in their mind, but really, I mean, they would be bored of that game in a few hours. They don't know what that kind of life is like. And for them, power over someone else is not the same as we perceive it. They're not ambitious. They're not given to boast and glory and to prefer themselves before others. They are ready to be taught and instructed. Before they live upon their father's providence, this is something that you don't have to have children that worry about where food's going to come from. What are they going to do for work? I mean, they live just because 
They know that you're going to go out and buy things and you're going to get what they need. You're going to go out and do the work. Nor are they malicious and vindictive. In malice, says the apostle, be children. Now in all of this, I'm not putting before you how to assess your child of childlikeness, but assess your child and look at them and see, is there actual converting grace in them? Yes, to be a child is to be in dependence upon your parents and having them look after you, and there is a certain humility about that. But that natural state doesn't get a child into heaven. Doesn't get you or me into heaven. The entrance into the celestial city is not a tall one that even Saul, standing so tall, could enter. But you must humble yourself and come down. Come down. Or you will be defeated. Now, you may say, well, I know my child. I know each one of my children. I know what they are like. I know that this boy is like this, and that this girl is like this, and I know exactly their temperaments and stuff like that. But we have to remember 1 Samuel 16, 7. The Lord sees where you cannot penetrate. You can't get your eye there. You can't see into the heart of your son or daughter. And children are different. If you have one child who is stout and proud and defiant, and then you have another child who's just naturally compliant and listening and and docile, you may think that that child is the one that's saved. But that's just their natural temper. Again, that natural state of humility, of docility, does not mean that a child is regenerated. Each person is to come down and come to Christ. Let the little children come to me. Even if a child is humble, they need to come to Christ. So in this, there's some preliminary considerations. Before we get into this, when we think about children and salvation, children raised in Christian homes, there's some things that we should expect when we're raising children. And I have them written down here. Number one, children raised in Christian homes often profess to believe. If you were to ask little Johnny, do you believe in Jesus? Yes, I believe in Jesus. Or if you go to church and they say, yep, we're Christians, we're going to church, this is what we do. Children who are in Christian families often profess the faith of their parents. Now this is somewhat expected. Children tend to take on the traits of their parents. Whether it's religiously, or whether it's in morality, or whether it's in any kind of temper, I mean, this is whether for the better, as in the present case of a Christian home, or for the worse, in the case of a Muslim home, or an atheist, or a Mormon, or a Catholic home. Do you believe in so-and-so? Yeah, I believe in so-and-so. Why? Well, my parents believe in so-and-so, so it's to be expected. Now, that's not to discourage you. That's not to discourage Christians into thinking that my child will always say that they believe in Jesus just because... They're born into a Christian home. Now, that wasn't the case for me. Though I professed faith in Christ, I knew once the Lord actually saved me at 18 that I could be born in a garage and that would not make me a car. God had to do a work in my heart and turn me from my error and turn me from my lifeless lust and bring me out of that grave Also, children take things at face value most of the time. Just as John Fox described William Tyndale, so children are simple and inexpert in the wily subtleties of this world. 
you ask children about, about things of the world and they don't know the, all the corruption that's in the world. There's corruption enough in the child's heart, of course. There's the germ that if grown is going to sprout into many deadly lusts and that person is going to be a slave and a prisoner to sin. But for the present, there's a lot shielded from the child's eyes and from the child's mind. And praise God for that. But, I mean, children are going to profess to believe, usually. Children raised in Christian homes often are unaware of when they were converted exactly. Brother or sister, do you know the day or the hour when Christ came down into your heart? Do you have it written down in your Bible of when you were saved? I don't. I have a good guess, but I don't know exactly when it was that the Lord drew me and took me. And same with children that they've been raised with godly conduct their whole lives. They've been raised with God in their foreview their whole lives. Everything to them was surrounding the Bible and discipleship and the gospel. And for them, there was no real crisis moment. But they can say, if they are truly saved, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. There was a point where I was, I know, I was growing up with it. I don't know the day, I don't know when it actually happened, but at some point in time, I turned from just professing that Jesus is Lord to actually having a heart for Christ and resting in him alone. Children raised in Christian homes often are able to pass for being a Christian themselves. Again, you can't see the heart, and you see actions and you see words and you see them imitate you and you see them imitate other Christians and act like other Christians when they're around Christians and that's normal life from them that maybe it's that Christian bubble where this is just all that they know and this is the way they live 24 7 so you might think this child is actually renewed when really it's just a a facade. Christians, children raised in Christian homes also often fall away from the faith. You, ha- you look at the percentages, you look at the numbers of the people that have grown up in Christian homes, professing Christian homes, and how their numbers are plummeting every single day. There's There's no more churches that actually have enough numbers to them because all of the youth have left the church. Because religion was not really all that important in the home. There was really no face-to-face talking with the parents about their doubts, about their questions about the Bible, about conscience issues, struggles, about the severity of sin, about conviction of sin, about the reality of Jesus Christ. And then there's two things that we want to avoid. Christians, children born and raised in Christian homes have parents that are either too soft or too hard on their children. Now, I mean, for those that are too soft... They may have a very good desire that I want my child to be saved. I want them to know the Lord. But out of that desire that is not really hemmed down with all that the scripture says, you would almost take the stylus out of God's hand and write their name in the book of life yourself if you were able to. And you swear up and down that, yes, they're Christian. Don't question them. Don't ask any hard questions. Don't examine the fruit of their lives. They're Christian. But then on the other hand, the other extreme is that you have those that know a good bit of sound doctrine 
and then will never believe that their child could actually make a sincere profession of faith and will withhold the privileges that are there for Christians like baptism and the Lord's Supper. The golden mean to all this is to be neither too soft or too hard, neither hot nor cold, tight but not too tight. We have a great responsibility, and we have to be aware that our children are going to say things and do things and think things that may cause us to infer maybe this child is alive in Christ when really they're dead in sin. But it may be the other way around. They may be struggling just as we are. You don't become a Christian and then meet perfection. You have a lifetime of growth and grace, and there are sins that if your child knew you struggled with, they would look at you and think, are you really Christian? So we don't want to be too hard on the one hand, nor too soft on the other hand. So for all of this, we can look at Generally, what the scriptures say, it looks like for somebody to come under conviction, to pass that threshold of not caring about God and the things of scripture and coming into an awareness past what they see in general revelation. The things that everybody agrees. God exists. God made me. God's handiwork is evident. I'm without excuse. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Past all of that and into a state of, I'm ungodly and I need remedy. I need a savior. I need someone to get me out of this. And you keep talking about the one who's able to do this. Now, unless your child is in an environment where the gospel is presented often, the word of God is heard, and emphasis is placed upon personal conversion, they need to be saved. You, child, need Christ to be saved, not just from fire, not just from outer darkness, but you need to be saved from your sins. Unless that's going on in your life, don't expect your child to be actually converted. Don't expect good things from God unless it's His amazing grace. If you're not actually doing the things that God has ordained as the means to convert your child. But if the above is being done, and your child is not flatly rejecting these influences, then you should see an accusing conscience. God made even little children with something in them that if taught by the Scriptures is going to become aware of how God is right and what he says is right. And when I do something that is not what God says, I'm wrong. And that's bad. That is evil in God's sight. Not only that, when he tells me to do something that is good, And I don't do it. I fail to do it. That is wrong too. And there starts to be this process of, I feel wrong right now about myself. I feel that when I do this, I'm I'm sinning. I'm doing something against God. Now, it might not be in those very articulate ways of expressing oneself, but it could just be, I feel bad about this. I feel sad because I do this, because I keep doing this. 
What's wrong with me? In their heart, they see that they're laid in the balances and found wanting. They've fallen short of the glory of God. They continue to fall short of the glory of God. And with that, there's contrition. Now, the difference between contrition and attrition is not nutrition. That is that somebody is sorrowful that they've sinned against God. That's contrition. But when somebody is sad that they got caught or that they're going to be punished, their wrongs going to be exposed, that's attrition. That's the kind of fear of punishment. But that fear of God that actually looks down at man and weighs itself against God and sees that they've offended a holy, holy, holy being. And that they need to get right with God. That's contrition. And unless that is there, there's going to be no saving grace. Somebody can tell you they want to flee from the wrath of God. Good. Yes. Like John the Baptist, we should say to them, flee from the wrath to come. But, are you actually sorry that you sinned against God? A one-track mind. If you know that you are a sinner and you need to be saved, and your child is sitting there doing nothing, loitering, idle, doesn't care, this is not that one-track mind. A one-track mind is when you go to bed at night and you think and say to your parent, I need to be saved. And then you say to them, it's late, you need to go to bed. And they go to bed, and then in the morning they're thinking the same thing. I need to be saved. What do I need to be saved? What do I need to do to be saved? Wanting to talk about salvation, wanting to talk about Christ, wanting to get into your mind and what you know about the Bible and about how to be saved. That's going to be evident. That's evidence that the Lord is drawing someone. A willingness. No longer is there going to be that obstinate pride that is barring them from actually coming, but they're coming off of themselves and applying Scripture to themselves. They agree with God's law that it's right. They agree with the gospel that it is right. Yes, I can see the truth of it now, and I can see that I do, I do need that. It's not only good for everybody else, but it's good for me. I'm willing, I want to, and understanding. Now, understanding the gospel, understanding the truths of God, I mean, there can be things that click along the way, but then there's this clicking of, aha, I get it now. I'm getting gospel things now. There can be an understanding about how God created the world and how he flooded the world and about how he made mankind from the dust of the earth and in a limited way pick up on those things, get the whole scheme of the Bible even, and how different characters are in the Bible. But there's clicking to them and there's interest and there's things starting to make sense about specifically the gospel. Now, we have to remember that in dealing with children, a child by nature speaks like a child, thinks like a child, and reasons like a child, according to 1 Corinthians 13, 11. So all of the things that I have just said to you isn't going to be brought forward to you in the most adult way. Isn't it perfectly reasonable to think that clouds are made of sugar? That's the way child, a child thinks. And you ask, they ask you about those kinds of different things, and it just that makes sense. It's white. You tell them it's made out of water. It's turned to gas. Water's blue. 
how do you turn something that is blue? Well, clear, I guess, but when you look at the oceans, it looks blue. There's this thing in children that they can really imagine some amazing things. And in grace, God lowers himself down to the child's capacity to think and reason and speaks in the child's own mother tongue to the heart. He suits himself to their capacity and his grace suits their faculties to respond, to respond as children. And so, on the one hand, when you think of being too hard on a child, expecting a child to respond to you in the way an adult responds to you is too much for them. Expecting a child to speak a way a child can and give an answer of this is what God's doing in my heart and this is what I need and I know I need it and I need it now. If God can speak fish in Jonah's day, he can speak child any day. It's not as if you will ask your children one day, you see them sitting in their room together talking, and then you ask them, hey, what's up? What's going on? What are you doing? And then they answer you one day, wow, we were just having the most amazing, intriguing conversation on original sin and the necessity of regeneration and of the perseverance of the saints. Father, it was a blessed time of fellowship. There's not going to be that transition, that difference. They're not going to go back in time to the 1800s and talk that way. They're not going to suddenly sprout a beard. They're not going to suddenly know all of the different things that you know. They're going to be childlike. And yet, with all the grace that comes from God and flows into their little heart and gives them life and is real life. It's not just truth confessed, but it is life springing up in the heart from God. Now you ask, what if all these things are present? What if my child is displaying these things? And what if you are displaying these things? Well, then maybe you are really already born again. Maybe God has really drawn himself to you. He's laid hold upon you. He has you and you have come to Christ. But even still, you urge them. Urge them to seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Look and, and look into the scriptures about what it says and Read scripture to them. Read scripture with them from Romans 3, Romans 4, all of those beautiful passages that are the center of the entire Bible explaining how our sin and how we have strayed from God and of God's provision. We didn't do anything to ask for it. God did it anyways. In his love, he met us at the cross. Don't go and get the run for the Billy Graham tract and where's that sinner's prayer? I need to pray that sinner's prayer in order for them to be saved because then I know the sinner's prayer will save them. If there's not true faith in that heart resting on Christ, there's no salvation. It's not about words. It's not about an incantation. It's not about what you say. Is your child relying upon Christ and Christ crucified and him resurrected to be saved from their sins? And so as with anyone, as with anything, repentance and faith is that two-sided two coin, which is conversion. That this will be evident in your child. That is what is necessary. Praying a prayer is not repentance unto God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now those who repent surely pray. Those who believe do surely call upon the name of the Lord. But repentance is turning away 
from sin. Turning away from, you can't list every single sin and turn away from every one of them because as Psalm 19 says, cleanse me from hidden faults. I mean, there's things that you don't even know that you do. There's things that in your heart God sees, but you don't. But a turning from devotion to sin, of serving sin, and turning to God to accept and trust in Christ alone. It's a receiving and a resting upon Christ. That word repentance in Greek is metanoia. The changing of the mind. And it's changing, it's turning. You are changing from what you were before. Changing your heart's attitude towards sin and God. And turning to Him. And faith is that Greek word pistis. Which is trust. It is reliance. It's more than just knowing things. And saying, yes, I believe that. I do. I think that's true, but it is actually resting upon Christ, receiving him and resting upon him. So repentance and faith, as I said, is not merely praying a prayer. It's not the same. It's not identical to praying a prayer. Repentance and faith is not just a one-time act. And so, brothers and sisters, you have children, then you want to lead them to Christ Always lead them to Christ. Don't just lead them to Christ once and then they're done. Always lead them to Christ. This is who we need. This is who we need for repentance right now and to believe in Christ. And you can trust his promises that whoever believes has eternal life right now. But you have just entered a life of repenting. You have just begun taking up your cross and denying yourself This is going to require daily repentance and trusting in him more and more, knowing more of him, adding to your faith, virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and all of that. And brothers and sisters, repentance and faith, it can be true but not perfect. You know this in your case. You know that with you, there are times where you have a foot-shaped mouth like Peter, where you have almost denied the Lord, and you have to weep bitterly. And there are some ups and some downs when you are in that ark, and you know that your repentance, even the tears of your repentance, need to be washed in the blood of Christ, as one said. But repentance and faith does not fizzle away. As 1 John 2.18 says, They went out from us. They were not of us. But they went out from us that it may be clear that they all were not of us. For if they had been of us, no doubt they would have continued with us. People can make apostasy videos and say that they're no longer Christians. They're denouncing the Christian faith once they heralded the gospel once they claimed to be Christians, once they defended the faith as apologists, once they were brought up in a Christian home and they loved it. And they would even say that, yes, they did believe in Jesus, but they're wrong. True faith is a gift from God. It is in Titus 1 called the faith of God's elect. It is something God donates And he doesn't take away. And so, praise God for that if you are saved. That's something that God has given you and he won't retract it. The gifts and callings of God are all without repentance. He's not going to renege on what he has done to you and done in you and creating that heart of faith. He's not going to turn that flesh back into a heart of stone, but he's going to carry it forward all the way into glory. And so we can have assurance and we can give that kind of assurance, not the brazen assurance to our children. Oh, you prayed a prayer. Yes, you are a Christian. Now 
You can be on my level for the rest of your life. And don't you dare question the devil when he comes to you because you're a Christian and you'll always remain a Christian. No. You give that kind of assurance that if you believe, if this is real, then God promises to give all of himself to you. And as I was saying, repentance and faith in children may not look like adult repentance and faith because children aren't as old and as experienced as you are in sin. You come to the cross with a heavy laden conscience and your back is almost broken from the weight of guilt. Why? You have spent your best years in serving the devil. And your idle hands have done wicked things. And your own conscience knows that God should strike you down for what you have done your whole life. But a child who's lived three, four, eight years doesn't know all of the ins and outs of the world and the flesh and the devil like you. And so repentance may not be as much of a crisis as it is for you, as it was for Augustine, as it was for John Newton, as it was for all of our brothers and sisters in the past who displayed such a marvelous change, whereas before they were black and they were filthy and they were ugly, and now suddenly they are alive and pure. There may be a subtle change for our younger brothers and sisters. So when we come to this, I want to give you things that really you could go to the scriptures and you could see this is what happens in a converted person. This is what happens to any converted person and then apply that, but lower yourself and condense your mind into the mind of a child and think for a second, this child is different than me. And they're going to say things that are different than me and understand things different than me. And yet, we see our Savior welcomed them. They, he welcomed children to himself. It's, you don't see Jesus welcoming a whole ton of unregenerate people to himself, unregenerate older people to himself, and being all buddy-buddy with them. Yes, he sat at table with them, and he said he's calling sinners to repentance. But he calls those that are parents, he says, you're evil. (laughs) Which one of you who are a father, even though you're evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children, but children, he welcomes them to himself. So I would ask you, parents, More than just asking, what are the signs that my child is saved? Because if your child is saved, then praise God, they are saved. More than just asking, what are the signs that my child is saved? You should be asking yourself, are there signs that my child will be saved? If God is the one who's the founder and perfecter of our faith, and he ordains the means as well as the ends. He's the one who actually uses his word to create faith. Then you have to ask yourself, is the word of God actually central in our home? Am I presenting the gospel to my children? What are my prayers like for my child or children? Is that present or is it absent? Is there a clear clear signs that God may do a work in my son or daughter's heart because I am leading them as best as I am able to Christ? He uses faithful parents to evangelize his elect who are in child form in your household. And this should be great encouragement. We have promises from God. When you look at Jeremiah 32, Jeremiah 32, which is one of my favorites that I do, I stake on this promise and I look 
to God in this promise. 32 starting verse 38. And I take this to God. He says, and they shall be my people and I will be their God. This is part of new covenant promises. I will give them one heart and one way and they shall that they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of their children after them. And I look at that and I see that my child is under my care and the Lord has done a work in my heart. He's done good to me. He's put his fear in me. And I beg you, O God, that you would do good as you have said to my children after me. That you would make with them an everlasting covenant. That you would not turn away from doing good to them. That you would put the fear of you in their hearts. That they may not turn from you. Now you may be looking at me and, and thinking, well, brother, that's good. That's, that's well and good. But what about if my child shows no repentance? And it's, I've been doing all the things that I should. And I, it's been 20 years now. And is God going to save them? What are you going to do? Are you going to give up? Is that a sign that maybe God is not going to save your children? I tell you, if that was me, and I could see no sign of repentance in my family, not only would I just look at myself and see, is there something wrong with what I'm doing? But I would beg God, please do a work in my children. I can't save them. What can I do? I beg you, Lord, that you would save them. Is God going to unsheath his sword against my sons and my daughters? Lord, please blot my name out of the book of life. Take me away. Take it out on me. Punish me. I don't care what you do to me, but save them. If that is not your heart, then you're lazy. And you don't know the value of that one soul. Think of what it would be like to be your child falling into the hands of the living God. It would be terrible. Does your child need to be saved? Then you have a responsibility to beg and to plead with God, with your whole heart. Wake yourself up. And maybe you're not there 20 years. Maybe this is just the beginning of your raising your children. Keep praying. Have their names on your heart and plead with God. You say, if they're elect, they're elect. If they're not, they're not. You plead with God. And you do everything in your power as if they were elect. You don't know anything. God knows everything. And you bring the gospel daily. This is something that is nearest to my heart. If you were ever to get any closer, you would get to Christ. This pleading for family I have a family prayer journal and I, I want to share this with you. And I, I have this because I want this to be not only a memory to pass on to my children. If this were to burn, the prayers are still there. If this were to be lost, God has still heard them. And there's a record. And God has heard my prayers. I pray for my family here I say, thank you, Father, for my gracious helper, Chelsea. Please make her 100-fold fruitful in grace in Christ, her Redeemer. Thank you for my eldest daughter, Naphtali, whom you love. Show her the truth daily and guide her footsteps to Calvary at every instant. Thank you, dear Lord, for Chloe, my little girl. Please bless her richly in Christ, your son, that she would be your child and know the benefits of the atonement in her inmost soul. 
Thank you, Father in heaven, for autumn, a little gem. Please make her up, make up her as your treasured possession as she is mine. May she fear you and esteem your name, and may you spare her. Father, thank you for our dear son, Augustine. I'm eternally grateful for this little boy. I pray that he would trust and own his father's God and believe the promises and surrender himself duly and truly to your service. I, I have prayed. I have prayed so many times. And I know that God does not reject beggars. And that there's no prayer that I have prayed, whether it's written or unwritten, that goes to the throne of grace in vain. And if you love your children and you want to see them save them, plead with God. And you children that are here, and if you're watching, you know that your father, your mother loves you. The love of God is even sweeter. And that he gave his son, his only son, whom he loves. And he was put in your place at the cross. And, and Jesus really did love you and die for you. We haven't loved God the way that we should. And we haven't loved our neighbor as we should. And that deserves punishment. Punishment more than, more than you could even think of. And that would be right for God to give it to you, but instead he gave it to his son. And Jesus died there and he rose again. And if you trust in him, God, he, he gives his word. He promises you he will forgive you for everything. Everything. And so you run to him. Don't wait. Come to Jesus and have life and forgiveness. And Christian parent, take heart from Jesus' promise in Matthew 28, 20. That in making disciples, I am with you always. We're to make disciples of all nations. Your heart ought to be geared first and foremost to your sons and daughters. You say, I, I don't know if I can tell whether someone's a Christian. I don't know if I can really shoulder this task. I am with you. Are you making disciples? The Lord is with you always. On this climb up Mount Everest, there are twists and turns that I'm not prepared to take unless the Lord is with me, directing me, and seeing me through. Isaiah 54, 13 says, All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. I am glad that God has undertaken to teach my children and bring them to himself. He can convey it in a way that brings indescribable things down to their level. He can open up a heart. He can open up a heart to him. And my last question is, do you know if you are saved. Are you trusting in Jesus who died and rose again? Do you have love for the Lord Jesus? Or is your heart loveless and lifeless we were to get a radar on your chest and it went boop, boop, boop. If there was love there for Jesus, 
is there going to be a boop, boop, boop? Do you trust? Do you love? Have you come to Christ? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the the love that you have. Uh, It is an everlasting love with which you have loved us. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ that even if we have the mustard seed size of faith, yet if it is true faith, Jesus Christ is able to save us. And he is the rock that no matter the size of our faith, but the reality of it, he will save us. Please turn us to you. Oh God, please stir us up. Not just emotionally, Lord, but from the inner man. Lord, please give us hearts to know you, hearts to pray, and hearts to love Christ and persevere. And if any, no matter how old they are, are here and are listening, if they're still without you, still outside of the kingdom, please open their ears and bring them in. May they come to you today. In Jesus' name, amen.